And welcome. My name is Zach Garrett, and I'm the Education Manager for United World Wrestling, and I'd certainly like to welcome everybody uh, joining here today. Uh, this is really our second part or second uh, series of webinars that we're starting today, um, and this is going to be on training plans. So our first set of webinars that we started back in, in late May uh, really focused on the introduction to coaching and safety. And so we went through a series of webinars during that time, you know, kind of along those lines, uh, along those topics. And now we're going to transition into a essentially a five-part series here on training plans. And today we're kind of going to focus on and just getting started, you know, what are training plans, you know, and what are the benefits to having those. Um, and certainly I think if we're getting into an area that, that I really thoroughly enjoy here, it's, it's looking at training plans and coming up with how to get those to work. And so I'm really excited to be a part of this uh, series here over the next, uh, really it's probably over the next nine weeks because our schedule is going to be set that we're going to be on one week and then next week we'll be off and then we'll be back on the week after that. So kind of be on an every, every other week. And we will also be doing this in four languages. So you can also be able to get this in not only in English, but in French, uh, Spanish, and also Russian over the course of this week. So, um, but let's get started. So we're going to look at just the, you know, kind of the basics here of getting started with training plans. You know, I really like this quote and I use it and kind of think about it frequently. You know, every minute you spend in planning saves 10 minutes in execution. You know, this gives you a 1000% return on energy. You know, when I think about this, you know, how many times have we been at a practice or been somewhere where it wasn't planned out very well and there was a lot of like downtime, like we're not sure what's going on, what's the next thing that's happening. And I think that's such a critical part as being a coach is being able to plan and plan effectively so that you can maximize your time with your athletes. And when I think of this, this quote really resonates with me because I think about, you know, if I don't have things planned out and scripted as to what is going to happen in practice, I'm going to waste time trying to figure out how to get that implemented throughout that time. And then it, likewise, I just lose training with those athletes. And so I think that when we look at this, every, every minute that we spend taking time to plan, we're going to see a payoff for that in the long run. And I think that's why having training plans is so important. And just coming up with just for each practice, we have a session. Here's what we're going to follow. Here's what we're going to do. And the time that you spend at the beginning is going to be so worthwhile and, and really just a variety of, uh, of reasons. And we'll get to those. Um, over the course of this webinar. But I think this is a great just kind of leading quote to what training plans and why the, what the benefit is all about here. When we take a look at this, you know, training plans is really kind of a mix uh, of an art and a science. You know, our training plans, or our practice plans are those scripts that we're going to follow when we walk into a practice. Here's what we're going to do. And we have it scripted out not only by what we're going to do, but also by the time period of which we want to do each of those activities. And, and a lot of times we think like, oh, hey, here's this plan. This is a really good plan. Well, keep in mind that there is no perfect plan or format. You know, this is a part that as you go through, there's some science and there's some things that you should do as it goes behind, you know, into this. But know that there's also, there's an element that you have to kind of, it's a feel. And it's something that you have to consistently be learning through trial and error. So as a coach, you know, you put together what you believe is a great plan, and that might be a great plan for you, but that might not be a great plan for somebody else, you know, for somebody else's team, for somebody else's program. And so what we have to do is as we go through this process, you know, we have to not only look at what are, what are some of the data telling us that we should be doing, but then also what, how do we, what do we know about our athletes? And we have to feel our way through that. And you're going to consistently learn this through trial and error. I can tell you over my, gosh, over, over 20 years of coaching, I haven't made the, I haven't always had the best plans. Sometimes I'm in the middle of this and being like, this is not very good. This looked great on paper, but this is really not a, a great activity or what we should be doing. So then we have to switch gears and go from there. And then we just make note. I make note of that and like, this, this didn't work well. What do I need to do better? And it's a constantly evolving process. And really that's because anytime you're coaching, it's a constant learning experience. Every time you attend practice, every time you go to practice, you're constantly 
evaluating your practice plans, like how well did this work? And then, you know, sometimes when you get to take your athletes to competitions, you get to see how your training plans and how you develop those, how they paid off at that point. And so, but this is going to be a constant learning experience in this process. And that's the part we'll be, you know, talking a little bit about today, but just keep that in mind as you go forward. And I think this is a really good thing to take a look at, which is the practice plan virtuous cycle. And I think this really kind of sums up what the purpose is here of why we want to have this. You know, when we talk about just average coaches, you know, I think average coaches are going to typically have some sort of practice plan. It may not be well scripted, but they'll have a, a plan going into the practice. You know, then they go and they conduct practice. Now, what separates the average coaches from the best coaches is what they do after that, and even sometimes during the course of that practice. You know, here, after they conduct practice, do you sit back and do you assess how that practice went? Do you make notes on it? You say, okay, this worked well, this didn't work well. How could we better implement this? And that's at a part of assessing practice. And any time you get into a, uh, you start self-reflecting on, on what you're doing, it only starts to elevate your, your level um, even that much more. You know, and as a coach, I think if you want to be one of the best coaches, you really have to follow this cycle. You know, because after you assess the effectiveness, now we need to take a look at, all right, what adjustments do we need to make? And then what are our objectives? And then we create the next practice plan and we just constantly make this, you know, a cycle. So it's, it's, it's really, it's a never ending process as you're going through this. All right. So I think this is a great way just to kind of look at what it is. And if you want to go from being an average coach to being one of the, the best coaches, you're definitely going to be following this process consistently throughout your coaching career. Next question that comes up, you know, why are training plans so important? And, and I think that this is a really a great quote here. You know, failing to prepare is preparing to fail. If we're not coming in prepared for practice, then we are not putting our athletes, our wrestlers in the best position to be successful. You know, and to get the best experience for athletes, the coach must be prepared. Planning takes time and effort. There is no doubt about that. Like the amount of time and preparation that goes into that part is so important. But there are so many benefits from developing those training plans. I can tell you right now, like we're doing a couple of workouts a week, and I probably spend as much time getting that planned out, you know, at, as what it takes to almost go in and run the practice. Like I probably spend an hour working on the preparation part of it, whereas I'm just going in and basically doing a quick hour workout during that time. But the benefits of having done that are so, there, there's so many of them that it's something we really need to make sure we focus on as coaches. So it leads to this question, you know, what are the benefits? So what do you believe the benefits are? So here's a quick poll question. So, so if you would take a minute here and select all that you believe here are the benefits of having training plans. You can certainly select all that apply here, so it's not just a, a one. You can select as many as you believe. So another 10 seconds here, kind of in polling and see what we have here as you guys are seeing this on the screen directly as well. So I think you know, here we are, we're taking a look at and, and everybody that voted here, you know, skills taught and proper progression and that learning can be maximized. I think that's great, you know, definitely the case. I think what we're going to see is ultimately, if you plan practice effectively, every single one of these are the, one, are the benefits to, to why you make a practice plan. It's not just one thing. 
there are multiple benefits. And I think this is a great list. And I want to go through each one of these, you know, kind of individually as we go. So let's take a look at this first one. Wrestlers are more actively involved. You know, this is such an important benefit of, of coaching is keeping your athletes actively involved in practice. I think nothing's worse than going to a practice as an athlete and the coach just spends the entire time talking and you never get a chance to go through and actually do, you know, practice the sport, do that, you know, what actually be involved in what's going on. And I think sometimes as coaches, we can have a tendency to get, you know, long winded. We can talk a lot and go through a lot of explanation, but it's so important that we keep them actively involved in this process. And we talked about that in the earlier, uh, in the earlier webinars of, you know, somewhere around a one to four, you know, for every minute of instruction, you know, I should be trying to get, you know, four minutes of active participation in this. But what this does is by having them actively involved, this increases the amount of learning and their enjoyment during practice, which are two things that we know we're really trying to accomplish with our athletes is we want them to enjoy it. And we also want them to learn. So keep you know, having a good plan keeps them actively involved. The next one, which everybody listed here is a benefit that voted, which skills taught in a proper progression. You know, that's such an important part, not only for just how you're teaching and maximizing learning, but also from a safety standpoint, because there's some things that we need to teach that help athletes to make sure they stay safe while they're practicing and as they're learning these new skills. And we have to make sure that we teach them in that proper progression. You know, for example, if you have younger athletes, you have to teach them how to land, how to, how to roll, how to fall when they, when they go to the mat. Because if you don't, that might increase their risk of injury. So making sure that we teach these skills on proper progression is one of the benefits. And we know this, you know, we'll know that we're teaching it because we've set up this plan to make sure that we're teaching them in that proper progression. You know, the next one here is looking at the pace. You know, I think when, we're, when we set up a practice plan, it, this allows us to be able to adjust the pace so that we can maximize learning. Because sometimes you go into this and you end up with athletes maybe that are, are more advanced, they're in a better position. As a result, you can move quicker. Likewise, you might come into a session and what you think they should be able to do, maybe they're not that, they're not that proficient at that. So as a result, we need to take a step back, slow down the pace so that we can maximize that learning. You know, and, and, and another part, too, is we also have to be able to make sure we're adjusting the pace, pace when it comes to conditioning and the training, because what we can't do is stress them too much, or we put them in a situation where we're overtraining them or they're getting overloaded, which their body's not going to be able to handle. So as a result, we're increasing the risk of injury and also not properly building them up to, you know, that, that point of being able to compete at their highest level in those important competitions. So I think having a good practice plan also allows you to adjust that pace. The next one is the ability to be able to really improve your use of space and equipment. You know, all of us probably have some, some equipment that we have in the room. You know, we have kettlebells, we have some slam balls, you know, we have, you know, pull-up bars, but we only have a limited number of those. We don't have one for every athlete that's in our practice room. So by having a good plan, you can improve the use of your space that you do have and the equipment that you're going to use. So you can set those up so that way you're getting a rotation or one group is doing one thing, one group is doing another thing. But either way, you're just improving your ability to be able to use all of those things, you know, which is certainly going to help you in your training. The next one I think is really important, particularly, I, and I would say even for 18-year-old and down, we're not talking about senior level athletes here. We're talking about those athletes that are just coming there, they're competing, they're there for, for various reasons. But what this does is by having a great practice plan set up is you will minimize your discipline problems. Like we know that kids can get off task, they can get you know, messing around, they can do some things, you know, but by having a great plan and you're efficiently moving through those things, which we're gonna talk later in other webinars about the transition time, the time to transition from one activity to the next is such an important part, but that can minimize your discipline problems that you have during that time. And lastly here, I think as a coach, the more that you do this, not only is this going to be beneficial for the athletes, but this is a benefit to you. 
this really helps you increase your in, your confidence level to be able to handle you know a variety of situations that come up and it, it it should give you confidence to be able to design future sessions as well because the more you do this and the more that you work through that process that virtuous cycle um, of practice planning you know the better you're going to get at it and, and, the, and the better your athletes are going to become as a result of that. But that should just give you more confidence as you go through this to be able to handle those situations um, in the future. The next part here is the factors to consider. You know, so what are some factors that we need to consider when we are developing a training plan? And this list, you know, and, I, and I, what I have, it's, it's, it's made in a circle here. And the reason why it's in a circle is because, you know, one's not necessarily more important than the other. You know, there's a lot of factors that you have to consider as a coach, you know, and just working our way around, starting at the top, or just kind of discussing each one of these as you go. But one important factor that you have to consider when you're, when you're coming up with your training plan are the rules of the sport. You know, it's our job as coaches to make sure we're teaching our athletes the rules of that, of, of wrestling. You know, what are the rules? How are points scored? You know, and then as a result of that, we have to factor that in to how do we adjust our technique that we're going to teach to maximize the scoring that, that can come as a result of it. I can tell you that a lot of times as coaches, you know, we think by watching a situation that this is how something should be scored. You know, just because we, as coaches, we know this is the action. Here's what it's going. But have you sat down and talked to a referee and said, hey, how does this get scored? What do I need to know about this situation? And this is where coaches and referees have to, it can really work together. They can really improve both sides of this. You know, I had an opportunity to speak with some of uh, some high level coaches in our country. And, and really, and, and what we did is we kind of went through a variety of just different situations. And, and, and I, as being also a referee, um, was able to go through and talk a little bit about, you know, how these situations get scored and what referees are looking for. Because then as a coach, if you know what they're looking for, then you can teach that technique differently to be able to, to, to either lessen the number of points that are getting scored or to maximize the points that you're scoring. So take time to make sure you really focus on and learning the rules of the sport. The next one here, as I work to the right of that, is the level of the participants. You know, I think we really have to get a gauge of where, where are athletes at and that are in our practice. You know, we may think that they are like, hey, they're really high level athletes, but then we start doing things, maybe they're not quite at that level. I can tell you right now, we're doing some kind of what we call preseason workouts. So our season hasn't officially started. We have a few months before we really get into like practicing nearly every day. And it, within that, in the practice room right now, we have three groups working because we have three different levels of kids. We have some younger kids who are new to the sport who need to be working on some other fundamental, fundamental skills. We have an advanced group of kind of, you know, middle to lighter weights that need to be doing something else. And then we have our bigger group of kids that need to be working on different skills. So when you walk into our workouts, you're going to see us broken into three different groups with coaches managing each of those groups. And so I think it's important that when we're making practice plans, that we really assess what level those athletes are at so that that way we can set up a plan to maximize their learning. Another thing that's gonna be important here is also the number of participants. We really gotta factor that in because how many athletes are you training at that one time? And based on that, maybe how you set up practice. You know, I know that that's a, a certain an important point for me when I walk in. I kind of know how many athletes we're going to have, after, you know, every day when we go into train. That allows me to figure out who's going to be with who as a partner and then how we're going to break up the groups as we go. So our number of participants is an important factor to consider. You know, the next two, I think goals of each activity and the type of activity, I think, kind of go hand in hand. You know, what activities are we going to do, which I can tell you in in a in, I think maybe the third or fourth part of this webinar series, we're going to take a look at practice plan essentials. Like what are some things that you, you know, some, some activities that are important to think about in every practice. 
All right, and so we're going to list some of those activities and what those are and go through explanations for those. You know, but what we also need to consider is what's the goal of that activity? What do we want them to accomplish? You know, I think it's important we can't just have something, an activity to do something just to do it. There has to be a purpose and a reason for what we want to accomplish out of that. Maybe it's working on technique. Maybe it's a, it's a, it's a live wrestling situational drill. You know, maybe it's just, can, you know, working strictly conditioning, you know, during that time. You know, it's an activity, but we're really, our focus is, is on conditioning. So I think those two things kind of go hand in hand, but both we have to consider. The length of practice is also important. I mentioned that a little bit in our last um, series of webinars talking about, you know, we're how long should each group practice? And this has a lot to do with where, where, where the level are they at? What developmental stage are they at? And also a little bit by age too, because we certainly know our younger kids have a lower attention span, which means we can't have a two hour practice for seven year olds. Like that's just not going to go well. You might get a good 40 minutes out of it. And then the next hour and 20 minutes are not going to go very well. So you really got to factor in how, what's that link of that length of that practice. And also that starts gearing based on, you know, where you at in your training cycle, which will be our, a whole nother series of webinars when we get into periodization later. The next one is that utilization of mat space. You know, are we maximizing the space that we have provided, you know, and making sure that our athletes are spread out, we're reducing our risk of injuries that come with this, but making sure that we have everything spread out to where it's going to work efficiently. And lastly, we talk about the last one here is temperature and just additional safety concerns. You know, as a coach, that's one of our main jobs is to make sure we protect our athletes and make sure that we keep them safe. And we need to consider that when we're making practice and we're planning is how do we address those safety issues during that time? This is going to be our main focal point of the next webinar, you know, in a couple of weeks, which is really going to focus on you know, what's the, how do we, how do we plan in risk management? How can we take risk management and then get that involved in our training plan process? And that's what we're going to take a look at in, in a couple of weeks. So the next part here is the getting started. You know, so now we're going to get started. What do, what do we need here to get started? You know, so I'm going to get, so first off, the first thing I would say is get a journal or get a notebook. You know, I can tell you I've got two, two notebooks right here, which were really from the last two years that I use, you know, and, 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 and all I use, I only use it for practice. I don't put anything else in these notebooks except for what I have for practice and the notes that I need to make for the coming year. You know, so get a journal, get a notebook and designate one of those for just having practices and for you taking notes re regarding that. It'll be one of the best investments you ever, you ever make. And again, it doesn't have to be big. Um, but definitely get, a, get a, a notebook with it. And if you have a notebook, take notes in it. You know, if you go through and take a look at these, you're going to see my pages are filled with notes. You know, as we go through things where as practice was going, I'm like, yeah, that, that's what we needed to, this didn't go very well. This went really well. What do we need to work on for this week? And I'll start making a list of those things that we need to do. But I'm taking notes throughout this whole process because this notebook, these two notebooks, are resources for me for the future. Like I'm gonna use this again this coming year to help plan practices. So if I have a good journal, have a good notebook, I have access to everything that I did from before and I can look and see what went well and what didn't went well and how can I implement it this coming year. So don't be afraid to get that notebook and then take notes in it. The next part here is just, I would start making a list of what you know. Like let's make a list of the techniques that you wanna teach. What are the drills that you have? And what are some of the training ideas or different activities that you want to do during practice? I think it helps to have this list because when you're trying to figure out like what is it those things I can do and you're going back, like having a resource of being able to go back, you know what, I haven't done this and this will be a great drill for what I want to accomplish today. But having that list is going to help you be able to plan practices later. And this is not a list that you make that's this is all you got. It's a list that's ever growing as you go through coaching. You know, what I, I can tell you what I'm teaching right now, technique wise, you know, I'm teaching uh, some of the basics are the same. They never change. But how I'm teaching it and some different areas that I'm focusing on are different than what I was 19 years ago. I'm doing different drills now than what I did 20 years ago. So I think, you know, as you have this list, it allows you to, to, to come up with this 
resource for you to go back and forth with, but you can certainly still add more things to it as you go. Um, you know, I think another good part here with having this is it, it allows you that if you if you have if you have the ability to have additional coaches, like people that are going to come in, they're going to help you coach um, your team, your program. You having this list gives them some guidelines and gives them some information as to what to expect. That way they can look through this. They know what you're talking about. They know what your terminology is. And this is going to help you and help your program because now you're going to have more people on the same page. And I will tell you that if you don't have assistant coaches, you need to start looking for them because I can tell you that, you know, what success I've had as a coach is not because of what I've done. It's because I've been fortunate enough to have some great coaches that I work alongside with. And they are the ones who are often hands in, you know, they're working directly with our athletes that are helping them get to that higher level. So again, reach out for coaches, but if you have a list, that's gonna help them acclimate quicker to this process. The next one here is utilizing resources. You know, there's a lot of resources out there right now. Like I would say 20 years ago, we didn't, like, it was hard to find things. It was hard to find videos. It was hard to like, okay, what's the technique video? You're pulling out the old tape cassettes and you're putting the tape cassette and trying to order those and figure out how, you know, to learn new technique. It, it was difficult. Now there are so many resources out there for you to use that will help you be able to expand your, your knowledge level. You know, one of those places is the United World Wrestling Academy page. If you go to, to our, our education platform, you get registered. You, there are courses on the history of wrestling. There are courses on the rules of wrestling, like just understanding the basics of rules and seeing the videos with it. There's the introduction to coaching and safety course. There's also the introduction to practice playing, which is a lot of what we're talking about right now. So you have an opportunity to go there and get these resources. There's also technique videos that breaks down some basic techniques and some basic skills, and it breaks them into the, the, their key factors of why they're successful. And you can use those videos to help build your knowledge. So certainly look for resources. That's one of them. Another one is simply books. You know, there's a series of books out there that are really, they're great. You know, even though some of these books are older, the basic skills, you know, what wins big matches? is basic techniques. It's not like knowing some crazy move that's gonna win a lot of matches. Your majority of your matches are gonna come and those wins are gonna come because of the basics that are being taught. And those basics haven't changed much over the last 80 years. So don't be afraid to find a book that has there and just pull it out and go through it. You may find some great, you know, resources in there that you can implement directly into your practice. Another one that I encourage you to use is if you haven't been, is go to YouTube. You know, there are so many videos that you can watch on YouTube of teaching techniques and different things. If you want to find a drill specific for something, go to YouTube. Like if you have access and the ability to do that, there's a plethora of resources on there. You know, and for, for me, I'm using it currently as well. Like I went through and one of our goals in this off season was to improve our footwork. We wanted, I wanted to improve our footwork and our stance and be able to move our feet better. So I started looking for drills. What are some drills that we could do that would help improve our footwork? You know, especially when we're not always in, we're not in the practice room. Sometimes we're just in, 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 a, in a field house where we're just doing, you know, footwork activity. So what are some things that I can implement there where it's not necessarily in the practice room? And so here's a video that I found and I've implemented some of these techniques. What's the secret the of the best of wrestlers in the world? It's their footwork. Here's 15 drills you can do to improve yours. I'm the wrestling coach. So here, this all it is is this video is really quick. It goes through some different footwork drills. And, and, and I took some of these and we implemented it directly into practice. And, and this is just something I found in the last month. You know, sometimes you just go through, you start doing some research, take an hour and just do some wrestling research and see what exists out there as a part of this. So this is just one example of a way you can go, you know, utilize the resources that are available to you. 
the next thing that I would, you know, one thing you got to keep in mind though, I think this, there's a lot of resources out there and there's so many resources that you need to ask this question. Does this fit your program? Does this fit what you do? Because sometimes we have a tendency, we look and we find all these great resources and we're like, oh, that's really great. I'm going to implement that. I'm going to do this. But maybe this doesn't work for our program and for our team and for our level of athletes that we have. For example, you know, if I look, Jordan Burroughs has a great double leg, maybe one of the best double legs in the world. Now, there's some things that Jordan Burroughs may do that I can pick up and I can utilize with my team, but I don't have an athlete on my team that is like Jordan Burroughs which means I can't teach and can't show exactly what he does on his double leg and expect my athletes to be able to do that. But there are probably some points that he does that I can take out, that I can implement, that when I'm showing the double leg to those wrestlers, here are some points that will help you be able to make that successful. But it's such an important point of, is, that you have to ask yourself because there's so much information out there, is does this fit your program? Does this fit what you do? Does this fit what you believe? Because there are so many techniques, there are so many philosophies that you need to make sure you're finding things that fit within your system that are going to work. All right, so that's one thing, I, no matter where you start looking for those resources and start building your training plans, make sure you don't get overloaded and think, hey, gosh, our athletes can do this too. Because it depends on who's showing it. Sometimes there's some, there's some things that they're doing that I know my athletes can't do. So keep that in mind. So this is just, you know, kind of as we get started with our training plans, this is just some of the things that I wanted to bring up and we wanted to consider um, in this process. You know, as we progress through the, as we progress through the, the wet, the, this five part series, we're gonna be adding more and more parts to it. Like the next part will be on risk management. Um, and then we're gonna get into practice plan essentials. What's the theoretical framework that we should be establishing when we're making practice plans and then actually designing plans themselves is what we're going to get into in that five part series. So we're going to kind of step by step take it as we go. So um, at this time, does anybody have any questions uh, for me that I can help, you know, potentially go through an answer related to this? I did have a, a, a great quote here from from Rusty, a good friend of mine, um, a great coach, great referee here. You know, the man who works with his hands is a laborer. The man who works with his hands and his brain is a craftsman. And a man who works with his hands and his brain and his heart is an artist. That's a great, uh, a great quote, especially when we're looking at planning practices. You know, how do we do that? You know, sometimes there's more to coaching than just, you know, having this part. So excellent quote there, Rusty. Thanks for sharing. And if anybody has any questions, please feel free to write it in that in the bottom. There's a Q&A box on your screen. So you should be able to, you know, just simply select that, type in a question that you have regarding training plans. And, and then I'll do my best to, to answer those um, here in the next you know, few minutes. All right, I don't see any questions, you know, kind of popping up here. Um, so I, kind of as we finish, so Clarence, thanks for joining. I appreciate you being here. So uh, yeah, I look forward to having you. Hopefully you'll join. It'll be two weeks and it'll be at the same time, at the same time as today. So the last, the last quote I'll kind of give you, and this is something that I typically, you know, fall back on a lot here is, is, is hope is not a strategy. I think hope is a motivator. I think, you know, people get motivated by, by hope, but hope is not a strategy. If we want to be successful, we have to have a plan. You know, we can't walk into practice and say, well, I hope it goes well. I'm just going to kind of make it up as we go. You know, and, and to me, that's, that's not possible. Like, there's no way I operate at a practice ever walking in without a plan in place. 
And so I know currently that's as soon as we get done with this webinar, that's the next thing I'm going to be doing is actually working on my own practice plans for this coming week um, to get those out because I usually type those out, get those out to all the coaches. So I have a not only do I use it in a notebook, I have it in a notebook, but then I also type it out. So I've got a collection of these electronically as well. But just know that hope is not a strategy and your practices and your aren't going to get better um, unless you have a great plan. So I encourage you to, to, to work on that practice. Know that it's a learning process as you go through this. Um, and is over the next, uh, next four weeks, so four more weeks from you know, the next four parts, I guess, over the course of the next eight weeks, um, we'll be exploring different parts of training plans and, and look forward to having you there. So uh, thanks for joining me today. And, and I look forward and hope to see you in the future.